Um, it's amazing that with all that's happening in these very interesting times that we live, the uh, fantastic uh, historian and journalist uh, Christoph from the Eastern Border podcast, I was able to have a, a good conversation with him about architecture. So uh, check his podcast out, The Eastern Border. So here we have this on YouTube for everyone enjoying uh, coming this direction. So stay safe, stay happy. Uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy. Greetings, comrades, and welcome to The Eastern Border. Today we have a special guest. In fact, the first person that I ever collaborated with, ever, on the show. I don't even remember how that happened, uh, but he'll tell you about that very soon. His name is David Gedson, a building designer and an art historian who runs a YouTube channel, will be in the show description, and also uh, runs his business with the site livingprocess.net. He'll design you stuff, basically. <laughs> very great guy. So, David, how did we meet? Oh, it was during the... It was either exactly before or exactly after the beginning of the Trump administration. I was in Lima. I was listening to a bunch of podcasts. I was listening to your podcast. And my podcast at the time, I mostly... My new content's on YouTube, but my old podcast, A History of Architecture, which I'd been doing bi-weekly, I was in the middle of going over Kazimir Malevich. Oh, yeah. And I... I loved your work that you were doing with history generally. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I'll reach out and let him know that I'm talking about this because with Kandinsky, uh, there was such, and maybe we'll get into this today, there was such an amazing creative explosion around 1910, 1912-ish, which had, it had something to do culturally with the greater Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, Russian frontier environment. And, you know, Malevich's sculptures and paintings were part of that, really inventing what we call abstract art. Uh, and yeah, I reached out to you about that. And we kind of had a brief conversation. And then we did our various things from several years. And then I reconnected with you. And we've been having some interesting interactions on Twitter and so forth. I just remember this, this conversation because art history, obviously, I've studied that in university, but it's not exactly my specialty. So I had to, I remember in that episode, that was one of the one of the hardest researched episodes I've done, because I had to restudy and memorize all these things that I had, well, to be frank, at that time, not that much of an idea about, but I tried my best. So. Mm. Right now, I'm a bit more educated and, and well-traveled too. But uh, yeah, this is a breather episode, as you you can understand, because it's gonna it's gonna get rough pretty soon with the dam explosion that happened today, and uh, also in between writing articles for Foreign Policy magazine. But today, I just wanted uh, to have David on so we can maybe talk some high art on this show as well, and architecture in particular. To you who are regular listeners, this won't be a surprise that we. Um, touch various subjects but to new people yeah might be a bit confusing i remember when um when i tweeted some things and someone said that they've been going through some episodes and and i look like a person with a bunch of red flags because how can we do all these weird subject matters but we do but uh yeah talking about architecture in riga that's the specialty thing we have two famous things happening here as far as i know we have mr rastrelli and then we have our Art Noel. And Rastrelli is kind of more widely known. He has also done the Winter Palace and um, and also the Maria Palace in Kiev. But I want to talk about Art Noel because I live in an Art Noel building. Not a very fancy one, but still built in, I think, 1904. Yes. And in Riga, well, we have a whole district dedicated to that. We have about hundreds of them. I'm, I'm looking at this... 250 from Pekshans. I'm just not going to go through all of these uh, architects, but it's the huge concentration of, of Art Nouveau here, way larger than anywhere else. This is what we're known for. One of the most famous architects that we had here was Mikhail Eisenstein, the dad of Sergei Eisenstein, by the way. Just thinking about how this actually spread here. As far as I know, interestingly enough, Art Nouveau got popular here after the Napoleonic Wars when we demolished our city walls and tried to expand outwards. How's Art Nouveau doing elsewhere? Because again, the claims that we have the most of it is what we get taught in school, but it might as well not be exactly correct knowing our educational system. 
that may or may not be. It's it's one of those things. It's like in the United States where they have arguments over who has more lakes, Minnesota or Wisconsin. You know, it, it depends on how you measure it. It depends on what you define Art Nouveau as. Uh, but there are many. One of the great things about Art Nouveau is that it tends to be like uh, like lemon trees growing in different areas. That, yeah, sure, they're all lemons, but they're going to have special different qualities. And I've, I've been so glad to have you mention this because I've been taking a look at some of this Art Nouveau stuff. And I'm looking at some images right now. And it does look to my eye, there are different branches, different subspecies, you could say, of Art Nouveau. And this Art Nouveau seems less like the Belgian French Art Nouveau, which is guys like uh, architects like Horta, and more like the type of stuff that you might see in Prague or the types, the stuff out of Munich in the, the what they call the Munich Jugendstil. Hmm. Um, and yeah, that's how, that's how, by the way, it's called in, in, in Rig here, in Latvian as well. It's, we call it Jugendstils. Ah, it is. Okay. No, that, see, that's very telling that they would use the, the German word instead of the Belgian yeah. appellation for it. But Art Nouveau, I think Art Nouveau is a really, really fascinating thing. And whenever... Oh, by the way, by the way if you're looking up some buildings in Riga, uh, check out Albert Street, like Albert Street in Riga. That's the thing which Mikhail Eisenstein built. He built the whole oh, sure. short street and he built all the buildings there. And they are, they look like a cake. All of them. <laughs> yeah, the wedding cake. That well, and that's something that often gets also associated with with Vienna. That you had the uh, Schlagsahne Stil, the, 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 the whipped cream style with a, with a kind of frothiness of the ornament. And the modernist, the high modernist architects, some, sometimes you'll have generations of art and generations typically where the, the younger siblings get embarrassed by what the older siblings did. And so they tended to like very, very straight, very plain, very simple things after this in, in the modern era. And Art Nouveau for a while got kind of a bad name because of this. Uh, I love Art Nouveau. And I think there's a good reason. There's good reason why it, it is so enduring. And I think it says something. You had mentioned this as, as something that was interesting to you right before we started. And I think there's something meaningful to it that there tends to be, even to, to a point of frustration that you were talking about, there tends to be a persistent fascination with this style and this time period. And I think it touches a cultural nerve. I think it even touches a spiritual nerve that, that we can get into. But the whole idea of the cities being like the walls being demolished, this was a trend that happened. Uh, Paris got housemanized. That was earlier. That was before Art Nouveau happened. But when this was happening in Vienna, uh, a, a little bit later on than Paris got kind of rebuilt and modernized, and it was happening with, uh, I think, Riga, you were saying, that even though some of the earlier stuff was neoclassical, as the city continued to be filled in over decades, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You don't rebuild an urban planning city overnight. But as as these new spaces of the torn down city walls were being filled in, as it got through to the 1890s, there was something where the industrial capacity, the new industrial capacities caught up with people's imaginations and people's desire for something new and different. And a, f a really fantastic, it was a lecture that was made an article in either 1910 or 1911 called Wo stehen wir, Where Do We Stand? The German architect and historian, really the godfather, I would say, of the Bauhaus, Hermann Mathesius, that he wrote this, he, he talked about, well, where do we go from here with, with architecture and design in this new 20th century? He, he was giving the lecture, I think, in 1910. And he said that the year 1895 or six was this this breaking out of a new sense of form and that was that art nouveau appeared he said as a wechselbalk which is a fantastic german word that usually isn't translated well it means changeling it means like a like a fairy that's becoming a butterfly a metamorphosis but then after a while after a few years it shook off its molting feathers and became this new type of thing again and he he was seeing already how art, art nouveau very quickly uh, it, it was a very fast art style, but you can see almost like a historical snapshot camera in certain neighborhoods, in certain cities scattered mostly throughout Europe, not so much in the United States, because the United States was a combination of more conservative and more impatient and like so progressive as to be impatient and so conservative as to not accept the new stuff. There's not all that much Art Nouveau in the States, but there's some. 
you could say that someone like Louis Sullivan or Frank Lloyd Wright is our own distinct American version of that. And I think that's fair. Uh, but you, you'll have these glorious neighborhoods throughout Europe that has this, um, it, it captures that that time in, in the 1890s when people felt that there was this rebirth of poetry. There was you know, Baudelaire and Rimbaud in France. People could analogize it to the 60s a little bit, that you had a youth movement. It was called Jugendstil, the youth style. The, uh, the idea that women were more liberated, you know, the big thing is that they would ride bicycles and play soccer back then. That was radical. thing here, uh, the, I, I read that when, when these buildings were being built, they were built as apartment houses for the wealthy, and the wealthy tended to be young merchant class, and the old old money hated Art Nouvelle back, back in the day when it was built, at least here in Latvia. And in, in a sense, as the time when this is created, we have our national awakening. Latvians become aware of themselves as a nation. So a lot of this is tied with our own national romanticism here in Latvia. That's very interesting. And I think that's very important as well. This sort of formed us. This is why Latvia loves our Art Nouveau, because it represented the fact that old Baltic German elites had been sitting there and dominating us and now are awakening. And like you said, this, this movement and this new style and everything, we sort of embraced it as one of the one of the elements that brought us all together. We have a very specific, as I learned here, because I had to study about this, we, we have a sort of Latvian architects who tried to draw some inspiration from our traditional pagan era buildings. And it was sort of a bit more heavy than the other styles. And there was special attention to these structural elements, meat, lintels, and greater, greater ends. Those things are the most kind of focused on in this Ah, the lintels, yes, and the, and the spandrels. I'm seeing in the images online, you have um, spandrels and mullions on the facade of a building. That's a, that's a good element to pay attention to for people, especially if you're walking around a city like Chicago or stuff with older skyscrapers. You'll see mullions are a vertical element that usually runs between windows, and spandrels is the element that connects between the two. And so, and then lintels, lintels are like a, a something that, a, a flat bit that goes over a door or over a window opening. And so if those those being heavily emphasized, but I suppose would be characteristic. Yes, that, that is how it works. And well, another thing which um, this Art Nouveau has done for our nation is that like Tallinn never demolished its city walls at that time. So they have this old town and surrounding it is Soviet stuff, which is like blockhouses and everything. Riga was always bigger. And Vilnius has Baroque buildings, a lot of them. But because Riga was so full with Art Nouveau in all the Soviet movies, we've been Paris, we've been Vienna, we've been London too in the old town. They always used Riga to represent every other European city that you ever needed. So that's why we also had a lot of Soviet film industry coming here. Well, it makes sense. It's, you know, and they often use different cities. If I, if I remember correctly, filming Amadeus, they didn't film it in Vienna because Vienna had changed too much. And they, they, they filmed it in Prague, I think. And so I guess you get a similar, mm. uh, it's, it's fantastic that people can, can enjoy such, such amazing intact architecture. And just for my clarification, and also maybe for, for folks listening, in the 1880s and the 1890s and 1901 and 02, what, what was the political status? Was Latvia part of the Russian Empire? Germany was real close back then. Yeah, we were a part of the Russian Empire, but at that point, we still had a huge, a huge very powerful minority of uh, Baltic German nobles. Mm-hmm. Because Livonia, at that point, Latvia and Estonia together, was a united province, but with huge autonomy, because Germans had arrived during the Crusades, and they stayed throughout up until 1939, when uh, Hitler called them all back. But we, we had a lot of them here. We have a lot of Germanic influences here in Latvia and Estonia because of this. We're a province of the Russian Empire, but we have a very strong autonomy here. Yeah, see, and that's... Again, this was I um, my own. I've been family history is something that you can probably decode infinitely. But my mom's side is a lot clearer than my dad's side. Uh, but without getting lost in the weeds, my dad's side goes back to, uh, as far as we know, Mecklenburg, oh, which is northeastern Germany, and then gets uh, blurrier before that. Interestingly enough. Uh- as a lot of my listeners are also fans of Paradox uh, interactive grand strategy games, they know where Mecklenburg is. 
Right. I, I at least know them because that's a playable nation in, in Europe Universalis 4, which I prefer. So, Oh, that's funny. It's next to Lübeck, basically. That, that's right. Well, yeah, Lübeck being the chief of the Hanseatic cities, which was the old economic yes. and cultural constellation there. And that's why – now, my last name, G-E-T-Z-I-N, Getzen, not like G-E-T-Z-E-N, the people who made the trumpets who come from further – East, but there there are even G E T Z I N Getsons. If you look at the Ellis Island, that through the miracle of digitization you can get digitally, um, is uh, quite a lot of Getsons with an I N came out of Ukraine. Oh, huh. yeah, it makes. Sense. And I had no. I don't know if there are any of them there or not. Well, remember that parts of Ukraine also were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's correct. For a while, so there might be a might be a bunch of mixing. <laughs> back to the back to the architecture thing. I want to touch a thing that we spoke about before we started recording, because I I live in one of these Art Nouveau buildings of the National Romanticism style. It's less like a cake, but it has a lot of decorative elements everywhere. And this Art Nouveau place is where I grew up. And um, I was walking down there, and if you look at the time period, and you look at again popular culture, there is this specific genre called steampunk. And, and there's a lot of video games like Dishonored right. and uh, Dishonored Arcanum of Steamworks Magic Obscure. A lot of culture going on in this sort of late 19th century, uh, early 20th century. Well, if you are uh, highly educated, you can maybe think about uh, La Belle Epoque, that era. Or Fin de Sicle, the same thing, really, except different attitudes. We add fantasy elements to it. But if you look at this, they only copy Victorian England. They only copy that one specific thing that was in England, which doesn't have a lot of pretty stuff even even if they even if they portray some sort of realistic cities it's always london it's very british centered i for example would encourage people who um uh, if and again a bunch of people who develop video games are listening to this show if you want to develop a, a steampunk ish genre game i highly recommend you also google up albert and, and maybe make something like that or, or look at the center of vienna which is just beautiful i love that city and just may- maybe stop making every uh, fantasy city set in this sort of time period looking like just London or Liverpool. That would kind of be interesting. I would agree. I think they should do that, certainly. And I, and another thing is that they're completely if. If they restrict themselves to London steampunk and are accurate about it, they're going to completely miss on Art Nouveau entirely because lo- for whatever reason, yes. London never did Art Nouveau. Again, it's that conservative plus impatient progressive combination that all us Yankees in the United States tended to echo a little bit. Scotland had a smidge of Art Nouveau with the very interesting, unique contributions of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, uh, who really anticipated more of the strict rectilinear straight edge stuff of the modern era with his really beautiful things in the Glasgow art school. But the, yeah, if you're going to do 1890s and things, um, man, they should look here. If anybody, if any graphic designers are out there, you may already know this, but look up, look up Alphonse Mucha and Peter Behrens and look up their graphic design and just try to not be totally inspired by the way those two guys do women's hair. Go from there, right? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's nice because, well, that's the thing. Art, Art Nouveau is it's a style, but all the buildings look so different, and it's really interesting to, to go through them. And that's a that's the thing that tourists also say when they when they come to places. And I, I think it's another thing you only learn appreciation for architecture, at least much more of it, when you travel a bit, because it's always interesting to look at all the various different buildings. I and you might maybe dislike me for that. I really enjoy how Boston looks. I somehow enjoy this colonial style churches, that stuff. I love Boston. You know, I went to graduate school in the Boston area and I spent some some good years there. Uh, I think at least four years there. And you no, know, Bo- Boston is fantastic and Boston has different styles. They also have brutalism, which which is sadly that, what was this? I think it was the town, town hall, city hall. It's called government center. <laughs> and it's, yeah, government so- center is they they tore down and they blitzed an entire neighborhood oh. you know the united states didn't get bombs to destroy its downtown so we just did it on purpose for some reason it's yeah yeah but but the issue is i've actually i've also seen good brutalism where the concrete comes through it's possible yeah it is possible to do that yes but but that that building is not a good example of brutalism even at, at least oh it's terrible at least to to my appreciation <laughs> But the good, the good thing about Boston is you go a short walk away up to uh, Beacon Hill. Oh, yeah. Some of the oldest 
amazing neighborhoods in the United States. That's that's where my ancestors, some of my ancestors lived way back in the 1630s around there. And yeah, Boston is amazing. And the, some of the Art Nouveau with um, stuff from the 1880s and the 1890s with Richardson, the Richardson Romanesque, oh. where you have these huge arches in the library. That's great. Now, Boston, uh, Boston is fantastic. I walked the Freedom Trail too, by the way, in full. I have the medal you thing for it. Oh, the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. We, we walked it and went on the USS Constitution as well. That seemed to be an interesting thing to do. There's one city whose architecture I, or in general city that I did not like being in. The, the only one from all the foreign places where I can honestly state that I could never imagine myself living there at all. And that was Los Angeles. Oh. It's 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 warm. Ah, it's it's warm. I don't live in Los Angeles. I live in L.A. County, and I do not live in Los Angeles. It's a whole thing. Go ahead, but you can you can tell me. Great. I don't know how this functions. It's just that the endless suburbia is is to me a nightmare. Not well. Not well is how it, how most of it functions. The thing about it, I never thought I never thought I would be living in L.A. County. When COVID hit, I relocated the business to Pasadena just out of a surprise and out of circumstance. I'm very glad I did for many reasons. The thing about LA County is that the landscape is a lot like Spain or Italy, and it's fantastic. And they originally had these little tiny communities that like that type of landscape makes it like central or southern Italy, where you have these small, little, tightly focused communities that, that are connected by short distances. And they were originally connected all by streetcars. The layout of L.A. was made with and for streetcars. And in the 1950s, even though the citizens of L.A. literally protested against it and the companies, the car companies and the Firestone Tire companies were actually convicted in criminal court of conspiracy, they tore up the streetcars and built the freeways all over the place. But there are little cores. The thing is, the, the places in L.A. County people pay a lot of attention to and that are famous – I don't like them that much, but that whole culture is changing because people no longer come here to be famous, which I think is a big relief. They, they they go, they make movies all over the place now. So it's less of a big deal. The whole thing's changing. I think it's positive, but there's, um, people need lots of houses and I help people build houses and that's why I'm here. But the, um, yeah, you get this endless suburban yuck, uh, through most of it, but then you get these tight little focused village type places like South Pasadena, Pasadena, Montrose. Let me know if you're ever coming here, and I'll point out some of the nice parts. But oh yes, Los Angeles is a good example of how to have things that can be improved. I, I, I was I was there in 2019 February, I think, and at that point I was there for a week. And out of all the times in the year, it actually rained twice. <laughs> it was interesting. That's been happening more often, I swear, with this uh, whatever climate change uh, might be hitting us. It's like we're shoved down halfway to San Diego. It, it has been raining more often, which has good parts. I'm talking about like our old town. Our old town doesn't have that many very old buildings in it because Riga always prided itself on being a very rich city. Basically, Latvia is, is 2 million people, out of which about a million lives in Riga, and Baltics altogether has a population of 6 million, and Riga is by far the largest city there. So we always prided ourselves with building the new and fancy stuff. And then uh, one thing that I have to say thank you to the Soviet government for, which is a rare occasion here, but our leader at the time when the Soviets arrived, Karl Sulman, who's kind of like our founding father, but he also was an authoritarian leader, but it's a whole mess. We, we still kind of like him. The, he didn't kill anyone, so that's good. He panically and frantically hated all the historical German architecture, as he called it, because that represented our 700 years uh, of living under the Germans, the, their nobility class. So he intended to demol demolish all of all of our old town, just down and replace it with neoclassicism. And at that point, yeah, because that, that was 1930s. So now you have a ridiculously ugly and huge uh, national radio building where... Um, ancient blocks used to be so they didn't even have the the odd luck to replace it with the tasteful stalinist art deco stalin was horrible but he had good taste in architecture you can well see sadly no like th that was before the soviets that, that was our authoritarian leader before oh. the soviets so the soviets come in oh i see so that's why we have our old town oh of course oh you guys were that's i should know you guys were independent that's yes. right and then the interesting thing happens one, one thing the Soviets did however we have a single a really kind of interesting building which looks exactly like in Warsaw, their big cultural palace thing in the center, which they call the Big Ugly Building, by the way, in Warsaw. 
and we have a smaller copy here in Riga. But Soviets had a stupid tendency, though. They, they sometimes built some interesting things. However, for the most part, they did not care about how how the whole district looked, how the street looked at all. They just, you know, you bomb a building and it has to be demolished in the historical center of Riga. No matter. Let's put a Khrushchevka there. It looks like a gray box, totally not depressing at all. And interestingly enough, while I was researching this, I'm very happy to live in an art novel like that or a building. Because there's a massive difference between uh, between this and and this is an interesting fact that I haven't ever mentioned on the show. Art Novel buildings, all, all the buildings built up to the um, start of the Soviet era, we have roofs for our rooms inside that are three meters tall. So we have like three meters from ground to ceiling. Soviets Soviets lowered it to two two meters. Oh, so you have oh uh, yeah, nice. And I can tell you, I, I was growing up in in one of these older buildings with a higher ceiling. And all the kind of decorations up there, and then when you have to move in and um, live for a while in one of those Khrushchevkas with a two meter ceiling, it really feels like you're being boxed in, and it's it's hard it's hard to it's hard to explain this. But oh, and and you are literally it might yeah. not you might like normal people on average don't, don't think about this, but but your living space really affects your productivity and everything how you function. If you live in a nice looking building that, that is actually, you know, pretty from the outside, you'll also be more productive, definitely. It, it directly impacts your happiness too, which is why I'm I'm happy that I can you know. I th- I think this is absolutely connected. Um a guy that I greatly admire, that I had the great opportunity and honor to to meet and work with somewhat some time uh, a little bit before his his recent passing. Um, I first met with him in 2013. Christopher Alexander, a, a famous enough guy, um, was bo- he actually was born on the outskirts of Vienna, and his family left because of the Anschluss, and then he ended up living in England and growing up in England, and then being a uh, professor at uh, at Berkeley and a practicing architect. And one thing that he wrote of is that uh, obviously it does affect our lives. And even it affects your life, even if you don't know it, just like noises around you would affect you, even if you're not consciously aware of it and it affects some people more than others. But he, he said that it affects people about as much as like giving enough vitamin C or not. <laughs> that was, yeah. And I, th- I think that's a pretty spot on analogy. Yeah, that, that makes sense. This also plays a part in our culture, in our way of thought. There is a thought experiment about how we even define things and how we name them. Um, like an example of this would be if you, if you, for example, look at uh, a lot of our languages in Europe have genders, you know, feminine and masculine. If you are up in the north, then the sun will always be of the feminine gender because she's the nice caretaker. And if you go down south, then the sun becomes a man because she's the angry burner of things. <laughs> That's a thing. And another one of the things that really explains this is the standard thing is to ask people, what do they think of if you ask them to think of a bridge? What kind of bridge comes to your head first? And depending on where you live and depending on, on everything surrounding you, that will change and bridge has a lot of elements into it. Bridge is an interesting thing to ask people to, to think about. And bridges, uh, in this sense, they, they show, and this whole sort of way how you represent the bridge in your head tells you a lot about whether or not your, your culture is sort of more aggressive, more imperial, how do you, like a lot of history stuff. That's a fun experiment. You would think, because I, I did that experiment on myself and I'm curious how it came out with you, but of course I immediately, it's like saying, don't think of the pink elephant. You're, you're participating in the experiment no matter what. My bridge that is the default bridge in my head is, and you can Google it up there, listeners, and you as well, yeah. is the Riga Railroad Bridge. That's the, with the, uh, it's, it's made from steel ah. with, with the arcs and it's made, it's built in the 1920s, I think, maybe earlier. I don't exactly know. But Riga Railroad Bridge is what comes to my mind when I think of the most default bridge in my head. Oh, that's a beautiful one. Yeah, that's a beautiful kind of uh, beautiful industrial and just describing it for, for people who might Google it later that it's, it's, it's like several like uh, several arch spans with uh, arch truss suspension. It's kind of unique. Um, and if um, now my my reaction, you'd think if I was an American, I'd be thinking of the Brooklyn Bridge, and I might even think of that of myself. But that's not what my brain did. My brain and my instinct—I'm not sure what this says about me. May, um, I thought of a bridge maybe uh, 700 or 800 feet long, not very long, and made out of limestone over a river. One of those. Oh, 
kind of like the the the, the famous uh, bridge in Prague, right? The the limestone. I'm gonna have to Google limestone. I'm not exactly sure how how you spell how you spelled in Latvia. But it looks like one of those walking bridges, I think, maybe. Yes, it would be a pedestrian bridge, and it would it would be like a horse carts and feet and bicycles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, then definitely, uh, in my mind, that 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 associates with the uh, Carl Bridge. I think it's that's how it's called in in Prague. Ah, or Charles Bridge, Ka- Carl Bridge, Prague. Yes, that that's that's what I s- saw in my head when you when you spoke about this. And there, pl- there are plenty of bridges like that, probably in England too, and and also New England in the United States. Yeah, but this this is the thing. Bridge in this case is an interesting example because we we use them all the time. But that's one of the things that it's not an everyday household object, right? You know, yet it's common enough so that we use them constantly. If we ask someone to think of a spoon, they'll probably think of something very very aluminium spoon. Default doesn't change, but bridges are very interesting for thought experiments like that. And uh, now we have ensured that both uh, your watchers and my listeners are now thinking about bridges in their head. Amazing. Yes, bridges and spoons. <laughs> bridges and spoons. They're related. You could get a tourist commemorative spoon that has a picture of a bridge. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. We, we, we certainly don't have a picture of that. The most interesting piece of architecture besides Albert Street, like from interesting in the historical sense, in an architectural way as well, we're used to it so much that we we don't know why tourists go there, but there is Riga Central Market. It's built in hangars, ish. The hangars are made from, um, as far as I know, uh, there are two possibilities: either those are zeppelin parts, you know, like the flying dirigible things, or they were hangars for such, and then got repurposed once uh, we figured out after Hindenburg that maybe that is not the future of transportation. Oh, I'm looking. Oh, but oh, but it should have been, man. The Zeppelins. I, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm looking at this right now. Those, these are beautiful. Riga Central Market. These, the, there, there are three of them together, and they look like. Um, the, the, there's no, there's another fourth one, uh, like next to. There it. is. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah they, they are the, the photo sort of either parts of Zeppelins or Zeppelin hangars. But that's how they made this. And then again, this architectural thing is, this is what you want to see there. For example, talking about America again. When I visited New York, I'm, I'm, I was starting to think that maybe people who grew up in New York, I think that for for them, they must think that uh, the sky is a, is a square box as well. Because <laughs> in Riga, we, yeah. we do not have skyscrapers on this side of the river to preserve the skyline. Skyline is very important for us. But uh, yeah, pretty weird to, to walk there. One thing though, by the way, uh, again, how architecture impacts our thought and everything. Berlin. Have you been to Berlin? I'm pretty sure you have. I used to live there. I used, yeah. Oh, excellent. Berlin, for unknown reasons, when you go to the blocks near the, the Brandenburger Tor there, it gets depressing. I mean, the buildings are think so? massive and tall and kind of being – growing up in a place where I've, I've been surrounded by Art Nouveau constantly, walking there feels like it, it, it puts you – it makes you makes you feel small. Do you mean the new ones? Do you mean the new ones around Potsdam Platz, Potsdamer Platz? Yeah, yeah, the, the the ones where like the because the walk space is is quite quite tiny, and then there are these huge buildings, uh, and they're wide as well. So they were just all of that was a building site mm. when I was when I was living there. I studied there and I visited there in oh eight, and I didn't want to go there to that exact spot around around the Brandenburger Tor itself mm. is still at least somewhat preserved. That was the old diplomatic area that began. Like the whole point of that gate being the way it was was to be the the processional beautiful. Uh, like if you were going to the palace to do government stuff, they wanted to show how nice Berlin and Germany was, and so you had that gate and the, and the beautiful beautiful it even you know it it's, it's even emotional for germans the unter den linden to have the linden trees along that um and that that's still and again talking about limestone that's kind of golden buff colored limestone buildings was traditional and then you had this neoclassical stuff some of it built by schinkel along there um that i love uh, i'm not a huge fan of this glass skinned pomo stuff sticking up all over the place in frank gary's stuff in um in in potsdamer plots uh that was a bit of the kind of uh tech boom hmm. tech boomy things i know what you mean by that in berlin i i w- when i lived there when i lived there i was a latter day aussie i lived in uh rosa luxemburg plots which was on the east side i lived in the part in the east where they still had the street still have the street cars and you know in the, in the comedy clubs that i would go to they would do routines where they tell aussie and vessi jokes still you know yeah, it makes it makes sense because 
for example, Berlin is interesting in the sense that you, you can't... Of course, if I asked my German teacher at school, where's the city center of Berlin, as she's an Eastern person, she'd say Alexanderplatz. Yeah. But that's by no means the center of Berlin. Berlin is the one city on planet Earth where you can't really declare where, where is downtown city center and where it isn't. I think that's true. Because uh, there were two, then they mixed up. That was interesting. Another thing, how political... How political decisions in history changes your living space. The same, by the way, with France, if you think about it. France used to have like these very narrow streets and closed buildings, and then Napoleon III decided that enough with barricades and just demolished a bunch of stuff and made these wide open streets that, you know... Exactly. That's that's the how you know these days. Just, and, that the, and the only reason is so that people wouldn't go out and, and build barricades again, because it was like, Sacre Bleu, Tuesday, barricades now. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't. It was it was so ironic. He didn't. It was so ironic. Um, he got his comeuppance right because he wanted to protect himself from the so-called mob of Paris, but he was fighting the previous war, and instead he ended up making these these wide boulevards so that when the Germans came knocking, it's like, oh, oh yes, thank you very much, and they could you know just surround the city and they they surrendered yeah. uh, to the Prussians in 1871. But uh, another city that did this is one that you've been to. That um, one of the most interesting 19th century redevelopments was Barcelona. And I was very much looking forward to hearing your reactions on what I was telling you on Twitter was what oh. I call one of the capitals of interesting architecture. What what had you what were you- It was weird. I, I'm a fan of Gaudi at this point. It seems weird. We went to the park. I love the cathedral. The the big one. Sagrada Familia? The Sa- Sagrada Familia, yeah. Yeah, it, it was it's really d- painfully expensive to get there, by the way, and experience the architecture there. The tickets to get inside Sagrada Familia plus uh, the Gaudi po- the, the park the one that he built a lot of buildings in, it costs 50 euros per person Wow, yeah. to get into both things, which is expensive for a park and a cathedral. But a cathedral is excellent inside. It really does look like a forest, and I highly recommend you, you visit. But you have to take it in. You have to look at the, the glass work and how the lights touch the, um, the whole columns inside and everything. And Barcelona, well, the thing is, they also have an arc, triumph, arc of triumph, which isn't, isn't there to to food and everything. It's very complex because again, these Gaudi's Gaudi's style is, as my girlfriend said, reminiscent of um uh, you know you know these gingerbread houses with with a thick thick layer of uh kind of coating on top of them. Oh I'm looking I'm looking at that triumphal arch in Barcelona right now. It's unique. No, no, that, that's not Gaudi. That's yeah, older. That's just yeah. triumphal arch, which is built there for World Stage. Yeah, but 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 Gaudi's stuff is in the park. Everything is very much lacquered a lot. It, it really looks like a gingerbread house with a thick layer of the the <laughs> frosting. Yes, that that's the name. Sorry. Yeah, it's um the it's interesting that you mentioned both these things and this. I had not known about this uh, the Arco del Arco del Triunfo de Barcelona. The I had I had not been aware of that. It's pretty darn interesting looking. It is really it it does have that frosting wedding cake type feel. It's earlier than Art Nouveau, and it's done kind of it. Well, it's very it's 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 like a medieval revival type thing, and it's done in red brick. I was told they built this for the World Exhibition, World Exhibition Fair. Oh, right. And then they just, just put it there. It was it was just interesting. I, oh, wait by a way, minute. The, Bar- the Barcelona, um, when, do you know which, what year that exhibition was? I do not, and I will now check. World Fair Barcelona. It would have been, it would have been after. <laughs> Sounds of Googling intensified. 1920, no wait, 1888. This was built for 1888. The 1888 exhibition. Okay, that makes sense. Because that, that would have been in the middle of the, um, Ecole de Beaux Arts style period, but this would have been a particularly Spanish spin on it. One thing, one thing that I that I noticed, by the way, is how Madrid and Barcelona look completely different. Oh yes, or oh, it was Catalonian, and they they speak differently too. Yeah, people who maybe don't know, um, and also to my Latvian listeners, because you we have our own regional thing. We have Latvian, and then we have Litigalian. It's a dialect, but it's very close to being its own language. However, Catalan is actually closer to French than Spanish. It's just completely different. It's interesting. Absolutely. There and if you're in Barcelona, you'll see you see like things written. They have some common words there, but a lot of words that they use for everyday things are totally dissimilar among each other. It's Catalan is not a dialect of Spanish. Catalan is truly unique. I've heard that people say, yeah, it's it's not an accent, it's a separate language. 
It is. It is, and it was just interesting about all this, all this stuff. But in Madrid, you can feel the Habsburg influences. A lot of this Austrian thing, uh, with, with the style and everything. In Barcelona, yeah, it's it's truly Catalan on on its own. By the way, Camp Nou is being demolished and rebuilt soon. The famous football soccer, sorry, for American soccer stadium. Well, I didn't know about that. I, lo- I love stadium architecture, particularly baseball stadiums. I've always wanted, since I was 10, I've wanted to make a baseball stadium. What? Seriously? What, what is this one called? Uh, Camp Nou. That's a soccer one. That's a very famous one. The FC Barcelona club where Messi used to play for many, many years is, is built, is going to be re- renovated and, and demolished everything. But yeah, interestingly enough, uh, while we're at it, we're, we're already talking about all sorts of things. Sports architecture, these stadium buildings, buildings purpose-built for, you know, activities like baseball stadium or, or football stadium, they are always interesting enough, uh, except, you know, it's, it's a different approach where you have to put in many people. In. Yeah, and it's, uh, again, we were talking, I think this is this is a theme that's been coming up, is that there's always some type of national or local character that goes into the particularness of something, whether it's a bridge, yes. whether it's these these neighborhoods and the idea. And you were talking about how the architecture was consciously reflecting the uh, the nationalist feeling and the striving for for independence in uh, late imperial um, Latvia. Let, let me let me let me let me just just pause here. Uh, this this is why I don't exactly like Soviet architecture. Because the universal usage of these Khrushchevkas, these blockhouses throughout all of the Soviet Union and all the Eastern Bloc, I think in a way that was also an attempt to kind of unify everything and oh, deliberately demolish these differences between our cultures. Deliberately, yes. And it is kind of sad to go and, and see, you know, when people come to me from the Eastern Bloc countries, everyone knows these things. And they were very practical. They had a lot of living space in them. A lot of people could live there, they sold their thing, blockhouses, like these sort of are very efficient city planning instrument. They're better than skyscrapers, definitely, when it comes to official using space. However, sure. and this, by the way, is a small critique of a little uh, YouTube channel that I watch. The, he, the guy's from Hungary, and now he lives in Prague, but he you know, he always says blockhouses are the best. I disagree, because blockhouses were intentionally built everywhere, so that, you know... Is this Adam something? Yeah, 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 that guy. Oh, he's he's interesting. Yeah. He's interesting. I mean, he, he has a lot of good ideas, but when he when it comes to blockhouses, he misses the argument that buildings are not built just to you know be practical. They're they're built for other things. I, I would agree with you there. When when Louis Sullivan said form ever follows function, the modernists misinterpreted him by thinking that he meant strict utilitarianism, ornament is a function. It's a function of feeling. It's a function of directing your attention. It's a function, Sullivan would have said, of spiritual feeling and expression that the to somehow believe, and you could you can understand that if someone is some type of communist atheist or even some type of uh, internationalist industrial American atheist, because we, we, we also get these 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 horrible puke houses and apartment blocks in the United States. It had to do with, with the industrial era, I think. And yes, it definitely tried to erase particular local identity. It tried to emphasize this universalizing, which often, I mean, there are ways that we all have things in common, and then there are ways in which it's just erasing good things, and yeah. you, should, you should let stuff be different. The thing is that stuff should be different because when you grow up in a city or in a place, right, you have this certain feel for it. Architecture forms the zeitgeist of when you when you grow up and how how the whole very much universe around you exists. It gives you a certain feel. And if, for example, you grew up only among these Khrushchevkas and blockhouses, I don't know if that could inspire you or something. That's how we create more depressed people. That's how we create more people who are bored. The, yeah, well, you do create more depressed people that way. There are studies about this. Christopher Alexander wrote about this in some of his books. There, citing the actual psychological studies that living in tall buildings makes people crazy. Yeah, it's, that's there's a thing to this. But the the thing that baseball stadiums, I think, specifically. Yeah, let, let's go back to sports things. Yeah, th- I want to talk about that. Yes. Specifically, baseball stadiums have learned, and I found this out, a fun guy on Twitter, Howard Blackson, he lives in San Diego. He posted something somebody else wrote about how Major League Baseball is now putting these kind of new urbanist, you call it, things that you should build a wonderful, beautiful baseball stadium that integrates with the neighborhood and pushing away this kind of concrete, bland, you could call it Soviet style or American international style brutalism, that we're not doing that anymore. Why? Because if you go over across three generations, 
The stuff that's junk and looks bad, it may be efficient, it may be fast, it may be cheap in, in some ways, but in the long run, not even in the long run, in the medium run, people don't like it, people feel bad, it gets torn down because nobody cares. You build something, you want something that's really sustainable, cathedrals in France. Look how long those have lasted. They're beautiful. And that's what people love them. Talking about ugly stuff, I just want to bring it back to Riga. Google up Museum of the Occupation of Latvia. And I will tell you about the greatest public shame that we have here. I don't even know why this thing exists. Oh, I know why the building exists and everything. Just Google up and click on images. Museum of the Occ... Oh, yeah, it's... Mm. Do you see Do you see the, the building with two parts, one being the black cube? Is that, a, is, is that a raw copper facade? Let me tell you what happened here. It used to be only the black part of this image that you see. It's, by the way, on the Lafia Travel. I hope you opened that one up. It's a, it's a two-part building. Uh, one of them is black. Other part is white. I hope you've opened that one up. Okay. Uh, basically, the left part, which was black, was built there first. It was built in black in the 90s to symbolize our oppression. It was meant to look depressing. And then, you know, as, as time passed and we uncovered more documents, there needed to be more space in it and parts of the museum were moved, for example, to the KGB center. And they wanted to build something that would represent our bright future, that we've joined the EU and that we're progressive. So they decided to build the white stuff from just bricks there and put it there next to it. So now we have a black box, white box, and they don't even match up. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, uh, there was a, there were like, 35 architects wrote a letter protesting against this because this is, the, is in the middle of uh, of our old town. And, and if, I can see why. Uh, this is the middle of the old town as well. And it's like, the, I, I think this is a case of stupid nepotism where one Likely. project won and we probably think it's because of kickbacks or something from the old uh, parliament or whatever. But this is awful. It was awful when it was the black box, but at least it made sense. But building a nice little concrete block thing that is white right next to it. Yeah. Uh, like I said, a bunch of architects just signed the fact that, look, if you want to build something interesting, they could have made it from glass and made an interesting addition like they do in the Netherlands or something. Just any anything but another box that is just white. I can tell you what I would have done. Oh, yeah. I would have done something where you can, like you said, I would go with what you said with glass and have the, so there's copper, there's pati dark patina copper with a little bit of green. And even though it's kind of brutal modernist, there's still some prettiness to it on the old part. And what you do is you have the, you think you can think of Art Nouveau if you want and think about how you have glass with the copper lacing its way through it. You know, and having and almost looking like it's growing oh. and growing towards the future. It's like they they could have done yeah. something great. They could have like added on. Like then again, structurally, it would be pretty bad if they added on top of it. I don't know. Weird. But again, baseball stadiums, not the sports stadiums, because I just wanted to mention this because this is currently the thing why I why I hate going through the old town at this point. Yeah. Because <laughs> oh, and uh, and Latvian National Library. Uh, oh sure. Then we'll get to the stadiums. <laughs> I promise you. La Latvia National Library is a thing that uh, people hate with passion because how it looks like. Some people love it, especially tourists, but it's one of those very polarizing things. It was built, uh, Latvia National Library is a new project that's built on the opposite side from our old center where they can experiment with everything. But uh, it's supposed to look, it's supposed to be a reference to one of our traditional literary works by our most kind of important poet, Rainis, who was a writer, and he spoke about the Palace of Light. That is supposed to remind you a Palace of Light. Not exactly. To me, it reminds me of the Berlin Opera crossed with a ski jump. Uh, the ski jump is a ski jump is an analogy. And but mind you, kids, when it's winter and there's snow on top, the, some of them sneak up and actually use their sled to drive down. Oh, they actually do. Yeah, and then they're being getting in trouble. Oh man. Is that fantastically dangerous that if they get off the side or something? Of course, oh, yes. Yes. It's as this is where NATO summits are held. Again, again, this is I personally think it's it's look it looks like someone took a, like a piece of, of liquid glass and just plopped it there and then it's solidified and now it's this. Well that's th there, there was a whole fad in the late nineties up till I don't know, twenty ten ish, there was a whole big deal about architecture that looked like either melted uh, broken glass or melted stuff. And uh, this was built in I think two thousand and twelve or something. That was right in the middle of all that, yeah. Oh, and no. it's but this is there's a symptom broader that oftentimes I, I I push against this I try to not do this is that people will tend to make architecture as if buildings are for thinking about instead of living in oh yeah and I, I I like to do the living in part living in part is nice but you know 
living in part, and this what this is what I have learned from my city builder friends, living in part does not include just the look of the house and, and everything in itself. It also includes how you plan your rooms, where the sunlight goes in, and at which times of the day the sunlight goes in, and also the living space around your house. It's all important. Oh, absolutely correct. Oh, that's part of, the, part of the real fun part, yeah. I have this weird situation in my recording room when I get sunlight in the middle of the day when I'm usually working. So I have to close down my curtains and, and turn on lights. And uh, my, my bedroom gets light super early in the morning, which I like. But my main living room um, gets light super early in the morning and then doesn't. So for the most part, I have to spend way more electricity than I, than I should. It's just weird, interesting decisions. Again, but then again, this house was built in a time where electricity wasn't as um, as widespread right now. And maybe at that point, 1904, we had electricity already, but probably I it's, it's like one of those new things which probably the architect did not think about maybe that much. Maybe not. Or, or there may have been other other factors as well. And are, are you on a first floor or it's upper? I am on the third floor. On the third floor. Uh-huh. Right. It's a six-story building. I will now take a screenshot of this. That will be the building that I live in. That's the National Romanticism style. I live on the third floor of this. Ah, there's the facade. Oh yeah, that's that's kind of that's that's kind of nice. That's like a typical late nineteenth century, maybe early twentieth century, vaguely neoclassical. What 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 year? Nineteen oh four. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. And interestingly enough, um, this is one thing that I, I tell to everyone. Uh, Do you know how much rent costs here for me? No idea. Four hundred and fifty euros plus bills for a three room apartment. That's fantastically good, and from my perspective, wow! It is, it is, and it's it's, it's just why well, I always recommend that if you're if you are a student, if you're from America, go and live somewhere like I don't know, come to our parts in Eastern Europe. We have a bunch of yeah. educational programs in English. You will have to pay probably at least here, but you know you'll have to pay everywhere because you're not a citizen. However, for your cost of getting a bachelor's here and experiencing another country for three years. And living here and all this stuff, that will cost you about as much as a single semester in the United States. And you will not have that. Yeah, it's, cr it's, it's, it's crazy. I've heard, I've heard terrible rumors that I think are probably, unfortunately, uh, true to a great extent is that UCLA students uh, commute in and stay at their parents on the weekends and then like live, stay overnight in a car which is because things, things are so expensive. Like every every home expansion I build, every new house that I build, I know it doesn't solve everything, but it's like adding a drop to the bucket when you add to the supply of the housing that helps make things more affordable for everybody. And that's that's one of the things I'm motivated by because, yeah, we, we, we just need, we, we got more people. We need more housing. But you wanted, I know you want, you wanted to get- Yeah, baseball stadiums. What, what, what is the baseball stadium thing? Because I, I know they, they're supposed to be on different sizes even. Oh yeah, different sizes. It's one of the beautiful things about baseball is that there is no strict size to the field itself. It's kind of unique about baseball like that because the outfield, the outfield was um, originally when they started playing Playing baseball, it was just kind of there. There was no boundary, all, all that much. But when they started having stands, that's when the idea of the uh, the home run came up. Uh, that that instead of being like a ground rule double, if you hit the ball far enough, that it would just kind of went so far. Uh, and to this day, if a ball bounces on the field and then goes out of the stands, you go to second base. You don't get a home run. It's because the baseball stadiums were built. As parks in cities, that's Chicago's city motto, urbs in horto, city in a garden. And that's what makes them, one of the things that makes them so beautiful and wonderful, especially the old ones, is that you're in the middle of the city. The first baseball stadium I went to, my dad took me to Old Comiskey Park. I was five years old. I go up the ramp. He points at, and I swear, this is the start of my interest in architecture. My dad points at that and says, look, David, that's called a Romanesque arch. I was like, wow. And I walk through it and it's all, and it gets all dark. You have this huge grand facade and you walk in, everything's dark, your eyes adjust. And then you go up this ramp and you just see green in the fields and the seats. And there are those famous guys and you can see them play baseball in person. And it's so awesome. It's, it's just such a great thing. But the way that the outfields were shaped had to do with the size and shape of the city block and the way you pointed the stadiums. And then it got to be a little bit fun and strategic because the parks that were bigger would hire a lot of great pitchers. The parks that were smaller would hire a lot of great hitters. And it, it, it's, it, it's a whole, baseball has its own culture of stadium um, 
in, in some great ways. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because football stadiums, they, they also are different. I think soccer stadiums, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably Wembley, the United Kingdom's Olympic one that they, they, they use for all the games. But I want to talk about another one. You were in Peru, but uh, I think one of the most famous stadiums in, in soccer, world football, world soccer, again, I hate the mix up between these two words, is the one in uh, Buenos Aires where Boca Juniors team plays in. Uh, they're called Bombanero or the chocolate box. It's an amazing stadium. It's built inside of a block, and it's the mi- it's like the minimum allowed size of a football stadium. You can't do anything else there, and it's. Well, I'm looking at a picture of this. This one's interesting. It's built super tall, and apparently it has also these railings in front of it because all the stands are so high up, and um, apparently they have a saying about this: uh, the bombardero does not breathe; it beats. Because there's a tradition when the home team scores a goal, all the fans would just fall forward towards the railing and basically shake the whole thing. Well, that must be an amazing experience. You actually literally feel the excitement, right? Yeah, I watched the documentary about this. Yeah, this is interesting because all this stuff, again, this is form as function. You know, they, they had a thing, they built this for the function, and then it switches meanings. Just look at many things in art and, and everything, really. You can envision a use of something and then someone is going to use it the other way and get a whole different meaning from it i think for anyone who hasn't looked that up yet it's a, it's a very interesting stadium it's really packed against the street like like christoph said it's tall with many upper decks and it's shaped like a u it's shaped like a big u with a flat bit on the other side yeah it's just all sorts of weird elements oh oh i want to get back to some bad architecture because that's funny bad architecture is always funny for a bit then we have our new projects envisioned by um, the Novar Rish of these days, the ultra-wealthy. H- have you heard of the linear city in Saudi Arabia? Oh, yes. I've had some. Yes. Uh, I just posted a Canadian joke about that uh, because of a, another guy's Canadian joke. The, uh, please, please tell us the joke. Okay. So this is so this guy, see if I can pull this off because humor spoken is different from humor Twitter. But to, so, that, so this guy who think he has other Twitter stuff that his family came from Saudi Arabia. So he has fun talking about Saudi Arabia and Canada. He's a guy who grew up in Canada and he posts something about all, all you urban planners, you talk and com- complain about the line in Saudi Arabia. Like they're building the city, a long narrow strip of a city in between walls in a desert or something. All you you all complain about the line, but Toronto actually built it. LOL. And he shows an, uh, a shot from an airplane when he's coming home to Toronto of big skyscrapers along a straight street. So what I did is I posted uh, something from the movie Strange Brew with Rick Moranis and that the, that one other guy, Dave Thomas, I think. And so, you know, there are the guys, there are the guys who talk like this, oh, oh the influenced winds world, eh? And so it says, oh, look at, oh, look at that. But you know, they, uh, uh, they built a line in Canada, but they built it right next to the big old lake, eh? Oh, maybe we should mail that to Saudi Arabia, help them out a bit, yeah? Oh, you hoser. <laughs> But oh, it's because no. because oh. the thing is, it's like la- la- ladies and gentlemen, we have a we have a art, an art historian talking in funny accents here on this show. Eastern Eastern border levels of of insanity reached. I love this. <laughs> Do you have, you have to make fun of, of of things because otherwise you'll just go insane in, the, in today's world. Absolutely, but it's I I, gr- I grew up in Wisconsin, so it's like a thing for me to understand about the. I, I feel him about the Canadian thing, but the, the the absurdity of it, the absurdity of building this long straight thing in the desert where there's no water. And it and it's multi-leveled and it's straight in a line in a, that is a reason why cities aren't in a line. That's called, you know, radial stuff, right? Lines are not efficient and you can't get any, oh, there is no green space at all. That just. Well, yeah, right. There, there really, there really couldn't be. It doesn't make sense. What are you going to do? You're going to have, um, and someone's going to build it. You're going to have like Augusta National Golf Course from Arizona, but have it in Saudi Arabia. They have stuff like that, but it, it's a trade-off. It's like how much, how much people's water do you want to use for that? <laughs> it's just like the sometimes it kind of feels people are just weird. We we're talking about the nepotism earlier, and that's the, we we got way too much of that in politics and everything. It's intensified in the past like twenty years. It's intensified, but the whole thing about this, especially with things like. Elon Musk's hyperloop Adam something goes off on that eloquently. I don't have to repeat his thing, but there there's a lot. Yes, and, and the, on that part, I agree with him. By the way, 
the thing about the line is that you're wondering, you're wondering if some of the people planning this know it's not going to work, but they're just happy to accept the grant money and the investment. <laughs> Absolutely. Like we have a, we have a bridge in Riga that was built through, uh, through our most corrupt era. And I think that's the most expensive bridge per square meter uh, on planet earth at this point due to kickbacks. It's, it's so stupid. <laughs> Again, bridges. We always come back to bridges somehow. One thing, though, that I want to ask you, uh, one thing that the Soviets did, and I don't think it's anywhere else, it's just the Soviet Union, when they rebuilt the city centers and everything, they always planned uh, streets in the central parts where, where things could go through to be as wide so that tanks could just mow through them. It was built for military purposes, which is why if you've been to Prague, you probably also have noticed this unless they've changed this because that was also an Eastern Bloc country. We, we have a lot of stupid tunnels placed in places with a lot of people going through these underground passageways they uh, put the cars up and put the made the people go down and below everything even when it wasn't happening there and i've have been told that this is a bad city planning well it's bad because it's like stair stairways down and it's uncomfortable to some people i suppose but people have complained to me a lot about the fact that we have these underground passages which are very blocky and I don't know, maybe poorly constructed. Like under underpasses, I've been to both Prague and Budapest, and I noticed these even more prominently in Budapest. You're talking about underpasses below wide streets? Yes, yes. Wide streets are there because of tank. It's, I got mixed feelings about those. I really have mixed feelings about those because it is pretty not, ple- it's, I'll put it this way, it's hard to make it pleasant. New York has those in some areas of Manhattan, um, and they don't. Chicago tried to make a whole underground, the Chicago Pedway. They did it in the 50s and 60s. It didn't work. Montreal, Canada, talk about Canada again. Canada has them, but that's because it's uh, ultra cold for like a whole fifth of the year. By the way, by the way, Kiev takes underground passes to a whole new level. I think it was either the world's deepest metro or Europe's deepest metro system. It's just super deep. And they love their underground stuff. There is in, in like a city center from the Hreshchatik, where or the whole Maidan Square is located, to around the surrounding parts. If you just walk one level down, then it's just connected by a huge mall with ton, with tons of tiny little shops. It's a whole whole shopping center underground, right? Which is why, by the way, where people used to hide, obviously, when the bombings happened. But they love their their underground things. Like to, to ridiculous degree. I'm wondering. There, there's a bit. There's a bit in Boston, in the Boston area, I should say. It's out past Cambridge, where the subway goes way, way down because they had to get below a clay deposit, and it would have been super expensive to tunnel through the clay, and they would add maintenance issues on the subway tunnel. I'm wondering if, with all that wonderful Ukrainian black soil, that if they had to go super deep, I'm wondering why they went super deep, and I don't know. Maybe it's because they had to get below that black soil to actually get to some good bedrock or something possibly yes see this is the thing i never even thought about the materials and the construction process of this yeah it would make sense also it was ridiculously cheap when i was there when it was running now during the war metro doesn't run but when i was there in 2018 it was about uh it was 17 grivna per ride maybe even less it was basically somewhere around eight cents per ride in kiev metro Oh, that's weirdly low. That's like, it's almost symbolic what they charge It you. was. It was like just weird as well. But yeah, kind of, I, I have to go get my drone back from the roof, which I'll film with another drone, like we spoke. Of course. <laughs> but All I right. want to ask you one, one more important thing. Could you please tell me, because this has been, an, I hope, an interesting conversation about architecture, its meaning. Very. Thank Riga, you. Soviet Union, all this stuff. And I wanted to ask you, can you name me one example of what you consider the best, most precisely precisely kind of zeitgeist influencing building you know the most the best architectural example and the worst one the worst one that you know and the best one that you know Mm, okay the best one i know it's hard i know it's hard this is torture for you this is why i picked it no one gets to leave the eastern border happy (laughs) so this is ah yes so so the entire well uh there are four lights oh okay now um i'll answer the question the best i would have to say okay i'm gonna say i'm just gonna go with my gut for the best, and I'm going to say the Dana, the, the Dana House by Frank Lloyd Wright in Springfield, Illinois. It's not his most famous house. The Roby House is for very good reason. And I love his stuff out in LA that looks like Mayan temples and looks like Daenerys Targaryens. How do you spell it? I, I need to Google it up, obviously. 
Uh, Dana. It's like a woman. It's named after it, I th- D-E-N-A, right? D-A-N-A. And it's, um, it's, it's, it was, I think this was this woman's last name instead of her first name, but it's the Dana house and it has this amazing, it, it's got a pitched roof. It's a prairie house and it has the most fantastic, I've been there. I, the, the interior is amazing. The exterior is good. It's got these green tiles. Oh yeah, I found it. I think, I think. Uh... It's got this horseshoe arch door. It's D-A-N-A hyphen Thomas, because that, that was her hyphenated last name. D-A-N-A hyphen Thomas house. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's excellent. And it's beige. It's, it's cream brick, probably made in Milwaukee. Milwaukee cream brick with this copper green roof and then green tile. And, and, and take a look at the interior, too. The interior has this sense of interleaved, interlocking, amazing space with changes of levels. It's fantastic. I love how the is is it really copper? Is it on the outside? Oh, yeah. sure, that's that's copper. It's like the Statue of Liberty. You know, it's turned green over time. The aged copper, when it turns green, it always um, ha- has some special impact on it. it. Makes it feel at the same time it, it shows the age of it, but it also shows kind of this. Like you seem to feel the greenness of it, and you know, and obviously you learn in school what it is. But this this is a very pleasant color and, and kind of shows some. Ma- it adds more majestic situation because you always associate it with these monuments, everything together with it. Oh, and the interior is just, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's glorious. As I'm, as I'm looking at it, it reminds me of some Oriental influences as well. You know, Jap- Jap- something Japanese there. Oh, greatly. He, he, loved, um, he loved Japanese stuff. He loved Japanese painting and art. Oh, he was highly influenced by Japanese architecture. And that was Frank Lloyd Wright? Mm-hmm. Okay, then. Yeah, and the worst. I'm trying to think of the worst, the worst, worst building ever. Um, let's see, the worst building ever. It's probably. Uh, do I want to rag on Peter Eisenman? Yeah, it's too yeah. easy to rag on Peter Eisenman. Um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe I want to rag on Daniel Liebeskind. Um, either one of those two. Oh no, 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 no! I know it. I know what it is. I know what it is. Well. It is. Oh, I definitely. It's Frank Gehry's thingy. Frank Gehry's building that he replaced build I think it was building 20 there was this great wonderful building that Stuart Brand wrote about this in in, in his uh, Frank Gehry yeah. building the guy the, who built the guy who built Walt Disney Hall yep um and, and now Frank Gehry has done some things that I Millennium Park in Chicago Frank did I think is is is, is nice okay yeah yeah but okay I'm I'm, I'm just trying to google this so much that I google Oh, if you do Frank Gehry, MIT, it'll come up. And he said about this, they demolished, they put it on the site of this wonderful legendary building that like in the movie, uh, real genius, um, that where the girl that the guy is, has the love interest and he finally gets the courage to ask her out on the date and she's sanding the floor. That was set. That was inspired. That funny moment was inspired by this glorious old building, uh, that they tore down. And then Frank Gehry builds this monstrosity. And for whatever reason, he said, I wanted the facade to look as if it were a swarm of bees. I'm staring at this now and I'm like, okay, Twisted Buildings. I've seen that in Netherlands done well. But then there's also this pyramid and then there's this yellow thing. And it's awful. It's that, that building, that building caused, that building caused the miscarriage. And that's what the woman said to me. It's this building is genuinely confusing and, and it's, it's kind of, the only thing that I could appreciate is is the 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 part with the broken broke like cubist influenced building put things put in there, but there's a tiny little problem with putting such short edges and and putting like these broken buildings inside of a building. How do people would live there, and how an office space would look if you have like this very short little tiny spiky corner? Oh, it feels. I well, you're talking about how how ceiling height level makes it feel. Yeah, you live in one of these places, and it's like, ugh, you just it's it. Yeah, feels bad, man. You know. <laughs> yeah, the the worst part. The worst part is the worst part still is the metallic boat looking thing in the middle, and then there's this yellow thing out of nowhere, and the colors are. I I will put this. I will I will generally put this as as the image for the whole episode. Okay, okay. This is happening. This is happening. People need to see it, even if you don't Google it. But, oh, wow. Maybe, 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 you can, <laughs> anyway. maybe you can put Frank next to it just to give people hope for the world. But, yeah. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Architecture see, matters. This is, yeah. 
this has been this has been amazing. You truly made my day better. And Wonderful. You know what? I'm, I, I I I want to come on your show and talk about this stuff more because you oh, know please. I have to be yeah. focused about the war stuff. I, I, I sadly I can't do breather episodes all the time, but I would be more than glad to come on your show and discuss architecture and art in general because we never even touched other art besides this and, and and other things. I'd be happy to because I've had so much fun and you know learned a lot of things too. So hey, I'm sorry, I just really have to go and. We're ending this conversation, and I'm not kidding here. This is not three takes. This is literally because I have to go to grab my friend who has a Ukrainian military drone that she builds to pick up my drone from a building's roof because stupidity. Ladies and gentlemen, he is actually rescuing his drone Mr. T style. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'll actually try a video of this. Anyway, uh, thank you for this. It was amazing, and please message me. And I, I am now genuinely interested in coming to your show and talking about whatever you want to talk about. And please uh, tell us all your links and plug your show before I say the, the famous words at the end of this. Oh, sure thing. And thank you so much. I had a great time. Definitely, there's much more fun, excellent we can talk about. I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, my name is David Getson. Thank you for listening. This was so much fun. The business and all about me, livingprocess.net. I'm Living Process on YouTube, uh, G-E-T-Z-I-N, and also at Hist of Arc, H-I-S-T-O-F-A-R-C-H on Twitter. Thank you. And everyone, go check it out. And yeah, this building, once you see it, oh, I, I don't even know. At any rate, the Svidanya Tvarish. And remember, happiness is mandatory. And once, once you look at the MIT building thingy, oh boy, yeah, this, this will be harsh for you. Yeah.